Welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us on this very special keynote this morning. Uh, my name is Greg Payton, and uh, I'm the co-director of the Winter Roundtable. Um, and I have the distinct honor of introducing Dr. Marie Maville, our recipient for the 27th Annual Janet E. Helms Award for Mentoring and Scholarship. Uh, Dr. Maville is a professor of psychology and education here at Teachers College and the chair of the Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology. And over the years, Dr. Maville has contributed generously to the field of psychology, authoring two books and over 60 journal articles and book chapters focused on multicultural competency in counseling and psychology. Of particular note is Dr. Maville's work on intersectionality, on the interconnectedness of identities such as race, gender, and sexual orientation. Dr. Maville has been a leading scholar in this area and, gener and generously shares this expertise with her students, mentees, and colleagues. I myself can attest to this. Uh, Dr. Maville was my advisor and my mentor during my doctoral training here at Teachers College. Um, and now, as her faculty colleague, I continue to benefit from the gifts of scholarship and mentorship that she offers. I'd like to just tell two brief stories uh, as examples of what Marie's mentorship has meant to me. When I was applying to doctoral programs, uh, like any good queer nerd, I did my research. Uh, and Teachers College was without peer in terms of its multicultural competency and social justice focus. And so I knew that it was my top choice. However, when searching for an advisor and a mentor, uh, there were no out faculty members at that time. Um, but I was accepted, and I began the program with excitement. But I still felt pulled toward connecting with a queer mentor, something that up to that point I had never found. And a short time later, luckily, uh, Marie joined the program, and I asked to work with her. And from our first meeting, I was struck by Marie's humanity. We connected around shared Midwestern experiences from neighboring states. She was coming from Oklahoma, and I was coming from Missouri. And we spoke candidly about being queer in those contexts. We also talked about the joys and challenges of adjusting to life in New York City, and our shared sense that TC felt like home. By seeing so many sides of Marie beyond her scholarship, I felt that I could also be seen. And that was a powerful new feeling for me. I've worked with Marie as a student and now a colleague for over 10 years. And for all those years, I've been attending the Winter Roundtable as well. In this time, I've seen so much more of Marie, first as an advisor and mentor, and then as a colleague and a friend. And I've watched as new students benefit from her mentorship and as this conference has grown. A little while back, Marie approached me and Dr. Sandal and asked if we would be interested in assuming the co-director roles of the Winter Roundtable. I was immediately honored and excited, but that imposter syndrome voice was the first to respond, and I said, I'm not right for this. I don't have the stature or the reputation in the field. I don't have the networks or the publications. I can't carry this legacy. And I looked back at her, and I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, that's exactly how I felt when I started. I tell these stories so as to share with all of you what I believe are two invaluable elements of mentoring. First, visibility. The power of seeing someone like you in a place where you want to be. That visibility leads to feeling safe, to feeling valued, and to feeling like things that you didn't think possible are possible. The second invaluable element of mentoring, I believe, is humanity. That quality that engenders respect and admiration, not through achievement or accolades, but rather that quality in which we connect around our fears and flaws, our dreams and convictions. We've all benefited from Dr. Maville's scholarship, 
but I have been, I am, and I will always be grateful to Marie for her visibility and for her humanity. And so I ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Marie Vaville, the 27th Annual Janet E. Helms Award winner for Mentoring and Scholarship. Thank you, Greg, for such a warm and, and lovely introduction. Good, well, good morning, everyone. So let me say that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so deeply honored to be here this morning to receive this award. As some of you are aware, I was at the very first of these award ceremonies when we honored Janet E. Helms herself. And if you were lucky to have listened to Janet yesterday, you realize how profoundly impactful she continues to be, both as a person and as a professional, a true mentor. Today, the term mentor and the relationship it represents means as much as it did 27 years ago when the Winter Roundtable instituted the award through the leadership of Robert T. Carter. This despite the fact that today, people actually have more access to resources than ever before. Greater educational attainment, higher incomes, both individually and by household, marital and parental rights for all people, basic rights and resources. However, as we know, that much more has not changed and has actually even regressed especially when it comes to attitudes and behaviors about race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, and poverty. And these days, there's what I will call the regression to the mean. The muzzling of free minds and voices continues at the highest levels of our, go our, of our government. For example, and I know this seems like 100 years ago today, but when Senator Elizabeth Warren, in her role as an elected representative of the, rep of the people, was stopped by the Senate Majority Leader as she rightfully read the words of none other than Coretta Scott King. This is what the Senator was told by her congressional leader. She was warned, she was given an explanation, nevertheless, she persisted. Well, my goodness, if our elected leaders feel free to quiet one of their own fellow Senators in such a public fashion, Imagine how the rest of us here in this room and beyond can expect to be treated. If your answer to that question inspires fear and the feeling of being threatened, if not for you, then your loved ones, your family, well, guess what, folks? That's exactly what these kinds of acts are intended to do. As a psychologist with a strong social justice identity, I've become well-versed on the many consequences of oppression such as racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, transphobia, classism, and that's not even a complete list. In particular, how these negative forces can become internalized as part of our own psyche, and we come to actually believe the things about ourselves and each other that are not only negative, but plainly false. We often hear today the important phrase, resist. That word resist has been used time and again, actually, by many multicultural psychologists and counselors as actually an intervention, as a means of overcoming these oppressive messages, words, actions that cause psychological damage. For culturally competent mental health professionals today, the word resist is a positive, critical step to wellness, empowerment, social engagement, advocacy, and change. So the millions protesting in the streets every day, every week, as well as through tweets and social media, they're actually engaged in important psychological interventions meant to address social injustice. This is the key lesson I learned from my many mentors in this field, starting with Janet Helms. 
Resistance is not futile. In fact, it may be essential to your mental health and that of your family and your community's health. If you're feeling right now that the issues that affect you as a human being, as a person, for example, your immigration status, your gender identity, your religious beliefs or lack thereof, your native and spoken languages, your gender, your sexual orientation, your race, your ethnicity, your socioeconomic status, your abilities have some political impact, what actually has been mislabeled and minimized as the term identity politics, you are right. And these aspects of ourselves profoundly affect so much of our lives. Our housing, education, our search for education, higher ed, careers, relationship with others such as your family, spouse, friends, coworkers, etc. All of which for a century of, of psychology has fallen under our normal or expected range of mental health work. A single experience with racism or sexism early on in school or in college can actually have a lifelong impact on whether you choose to stay in a field. I actually remember, I actually started in 1995 as an assistant professor in the reddest state in America, Oklahoma. There are many good people in Oklahoma, um, so it's not about that, however. <laughs> I love many people in Oklahoma. I still remember, though, my first year attending a residence hall event called Women of the World. And uh, we were just talking about our experiences as, as women. And there were actually young students there who were in some fields like agriculture and so on who had had male professors tell them to their face, you do not belong here literally told to their face, you do not belong here. I felt shock, of course. We know this happens, right? I am still sentient enough to feel shock when I hear that. And so I told them, uncertain, without any uncertainty, those professors were wrong. They were dead wrong to say that to you. In that moment, it felt empowering uh, because my first year as a student, I'd heard these kinds of comments made. So to be able to flip that script and to say something differently to the students felt good. But of course, you know, as I think about it, how confusing that might have felt for them. Now, now I think about it later, but I hope that had an impact on them because we know that sexism is still today. And I want you all, those of you who are Uber fans, to think about that. So as a result, what is personal and political, therefore, must necessarily be part of our professional work. As psychologists, counselors, and educators, in other words, the personal is the political is the professional. My personal political professional journey became very salient to me during my training to become a psychologist, especially under the mentorship of Janet. And I soon adopted a social justice orientation as part of my professional identity. Since my days as an undergraduate, social justice had been a part of me, particularly when I began to take Latin American <coughs> studies classes, learn about the scary, subversive role that the United States played in the shape of Ford Falcons in order to ensure dictators' reigns and the wrongful disappearance of citizens, and at the same time, the impactful tears of mothers on the plazas demanding to know what happened to their children. Some of those mothers are still demanding today, 30 to 40 years later. I learned about Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed and the Principles of Liberation Psychology. I also studied a little bit of women's study, but at that time, it was often from a white feminist perspective. Of course, that is valid, but it's just simply not the only perspective on gender depression. A large part of my journey as a graduate student was there, therefore in beginning to understand the impact of both oppression and privilege on my life as well as that of others. So let me start with even further back than undergraduate days, of course, my childhood. And obviously my first mentors are my family, my parents. I'm the daughter of Beatriz Mivil de Guzman, who emigrated from Bogota, Colombia, and was an international student. 
She came to the United States for one of the most common and important reasons anybody goes to any country around this world, to study and to learn. She was very excited to come to the U.S. She still talks about it in glowing terms to this day at the age of 92. She met my father, Roland, after leaving college per the pressure of her father who felt daughters need to be at home. So he was pressuring her to come back to, the, to Colombia. However, my mother being, you know, a little bit revolutionary there, decided to work uh, in Miami for a year. And during that time, she met my dad. They met and married in six months, and, and then were together for 56 years. My parents, as, as I said, were my mentors, as well some of my extended family, my Tia Lucia, next to my mom there in the pink. They taught me spiritual values, discipline, the importance of education, spirituality, language, customs, and so on. I also learned early on that, that even in my close family, though, there were different roles we played. We each belonged to different groups. I was and am only still the only girl, la niña, which garnered me, of course, some privileges, of course, um, my own room, my own clothes, even sometimes a more lenient attitude from my dad, who didn't want to repeat uh, kind of the abusive way his own father had been with my dad's sisters. My dad came from poverty and a, and a pretty difficult family life. I also learned, especially as I grew into an adult, that there would be plenty of don'ts as a girl in the larger society, such as you're just a girl, you can't or you're not allowed to do X and X number of things, be a wife and mother, because that is God's greatest role for you. As a child, I also witnessed openly racist and ethno-violent attitudes and comments expressed to my mother because she spoke English as a non-native speaker. As we're seeing today, there was much anger and resentment toward immigrants, like my mom, in Miami, in the US as a whole in those days. Soon after, as a matter of fact, when I was a teenager, there was a tremendous white flight from Miami-Dade County. And I still remember a common saying in the 1970s and 80s was, will the last American leaving Miami please bring the flag? Enter Janet into my life. First as a course instructor and a mentor. This picture of Janet here on the left is Janet at the very first Winter Roundtable, 1983. And the photos on my right are a lot more recent, obviously. This is when I was uh, directing the roundtable, and uh, Janet graciously has come many times over the years, as she was here yesterday. And that on the top is one of my brothers in the field, Dr. Alvin Alvarez, and then on the bottom is one of Janet's what I call academic grandchildren, uh, Dr. Georgia Wedway, who was a coordinator for the roundtable for many, many years. Now, the life and legacy of Janet has been written about and filmed in a variety of ways, so I'm just going to talk about a couple of poignant uh, comments and stories. And the first is from a paper that she and I wrote together with Lillian Comas Diaz a couple of years ago when we celebrated the quarter century anniversary of the Helms Mentoring Award. And this is what Janet said about her own experiences in graduate school of mentoring. She wrote, I've not had any professional mentors, which probably had something to do with how I define myself as a mentor. Essentially, what I know about the profession, I know from watching other people who had mentors and were trying to figure out what I needed to do in order to survive the system. She also noted, I was the only person of color in my graduate program. So I had no allies of color. There were no faculty of color. She had no mentors of color. There were no other students of color. Her friends tended to be what are known as white ethnics. Um, who she thought were not necessarily considered at that time real white people. Um, for example, she says, my best friend was Polish, and people were always telling Polish jokes about her. And so they bonded over that discrimination. She also said, the way I learned about things, as I mentioned, is by watching the mentoring that happened with the faculty and my white peers. I learned about APA, for example, because my graduate advisor, who was supposed to be working with me on research, 
decided that he liked this other white woman. So he spent all his time mentoring her. And then he invited her to go to AP. Turns out she was scared to go by herself. Gee, I wonder why. And so she asked Janet to go. He paid for her. Janet paid for herself. But Janet, um, really always the survivor, it's truly, she said, I learned there was an APA. So now when I work with my students, I just say, you know what, there's an APA. And the way you can get to be known in your profession to get a job, because she always said, Marie, never work for free. <laughs> True enough for the work that we do, right? Is by going to APA and doing some presentations. So that's what she does. She mentors people to, to go, get out there, get known, get, put yourself forward. And then, as, uh, as it turns out, Janet mentioned this yesterday in her talk, she published this absolutely amazing, just stark and stirring uh, talk, uh, paper about the recent pres presidential election. And this was published in uh, Latino Psychology Today. Just a shout out to our, the editors who are here in the room, Dr. Uh, Doctors Hector Adamas and Nayeli Chavez Duena. Yay. <laughs> So this is what Janet says, right to the point. White heterosexual male privilege, what she likes to call wimp, <laughs> fought for and won the election of 2016. Wimp is buttressed by racism, but is not racism. Racism and ethno-violence are longstanding tools for maintaining wimp, but in this election era, misogyny, anti-femininity, Islamophobia, homophobia, anti-Semitism became additional tools. But they too don't talk about white privilege. Heterosexual manhood, which by the way, presumes cisgender status, is a privileged status that men enjoy because they are born male rather than female. The power to control society's resources, which includes women, and determine the rules for competing for them is considered to be men's birthright. In the US, all of us are socialized to this belief system. And most of the social institutions just, they're, they're set up to maintain this kind of system. Most men, she writes, regardless of socioeconomic status or race, attempt to protect that privileged status unless there's a conscious decision about it. Racism and ethnic violence are symptoms of WIMP that camouflage it. Racism is a system of oppression that protects WIMP by attributing inferiority to racial groups of color to deny them equity, justice, and access to society's resources. Ethno violence is aggression and intimidation directed toward members of ethnic cultural groups because their unwillingness to acculturate is perceived as threatening to WIMP. Both racism and ethno-violence can occur at multiple levels, including systemic, which we're seeing already, building a wall, instituting Muslim reg registries, suppressing the African-American vote, as well as interpersonal, the continuing stereotypes that we hear, and now sadly, we hear tweeted constantly, forcing Muslim women to remove their hijabs are just some examples. In other words, racism is a set, of symptoms, a, a set of symptoms, but white heterosexual male privilege is the disease. And then finally, Janet's, I always thought, humble thoughts on mentoring. Most of the people I mentor directly are people who do not fit the system in one way or another. And I try to help them learn what I've learned so that they can achieve whatever their particular goals happen to be. I also try to encourage them to pass it on and make sure that the mentoring I give them is given then to someone else. And she talks especially for women of color. For many of us, it's still very hard for us to find mentors in this field. And so another very important mentor, who's also, I'm so happy to say, is in the audience today, Dr. Samuel Johnson, please stand.
And whether you know it or not, Dr. Johnson is all of yours mentors too. Because in 1983, he gathered colleagues together interested in race and ethnicity from around the country to start the round table. His courage, vision, foresight to bring this gathering together and which continues today now thanks to the tremendous leadership of Drs. Riddy, Sandel, and Greg Payton. Yay! <laughs> and I will say this was a conference that Janet mentored me quite strongly to attend. All of her students attended yearly. It was, it was a, a pilgrimage for us. And so it was, I was actually here, the first round table ever came was the actual year, 27 years ago, that Janet accepted this very award. And yes, thank you, Janet. And a particular shout out to one of her advisees, who also is a Helms Mentoring Award winner, Robert T. Carter, who established that award. The roundtable and events such as these was and remains major community building and mentoring events. So if you're new to the field, and I know there are a number of you here, you know, I hope you have felt and continue to feel this is a place you can just go up to people and say, hello, I'm so-and-so. Let's, let's, let's have a talk. Let's have a conversation. And what is the big darn deal about a conference anyways, right? Well, it gathers people. It sparks conversation that can lead to action, that lead to change. It provides a spirited support of who we are as individuals and professionals of our various identities. Today, there are other kinds of events. There's uh, conferences by the Ethnic Minority uh, Psych Association, and there's even now, I'm so happy and proud to say, a conference, and it's actually been uh, partially begun, you know, in part by two of our TC alum, Dr. Kevin Nadal and David Rivera, the LGBTQ Scholars of Color Conference. And we're having our second one this year right here in New York City in April. Yay. So the march goes on. Other uh, important mentors to me, of course, have been Latina leaders. And here are three of my, my goddesses uh, that have guided me throughout my entire career whether they knew me or not. And that's a very important piece about uh, this morning's talk. We have Dr. Patricia Arredondo up there on the red, in the red. She is the person who helped refound, it was her leadership that helped refound the National Latino Psychological Association among her many, many achievements. The, one of the other ones is the multicultural guidelines. We have Dr. Melba Vasquez down in the bottom there at the podium, this very podium actually the first woman of color ever elected as president of APA. And then Dr. Lillian Comastias, who won the, that 25th Helms Award. All of these three women are so amazing. Please read every single word they've ever written. Uh, they're just, <laughs> you will learn, and you will feel just inspired to go out and do yourself. So let me share with you a little bit of what Lillian's uh, view of mentoring is. And this, that top title there says it all. For me, mentoring has been my lifeline. I believe in mentoring and have made a commitment to that. I've been mentored by many people and in turn, I am a mentor to others as a way of giving back. To me, mentoring refers to a very broad set of activities because you can be mentoring someone without even knowing you're mentoring them. What I mean by this, she says, I've been mentored by teachers, relatives, friends, and it's given me the liberty to try, achieve goals, to deal with adversity and all kinds of obstacles. So mentoring for me is very involved and near and dear to my heart in terms of, very important word for mentoring, empowerment. Lillian uses two metaphors from uh, uh, Latina culture to, to describe what mentoring in particular means. For example, she says, I see myself as a partera, a midwife, one who helps women give birth. I help the person to give birth to themselves, and I'm just there to assist. 
This metaphor has really helped me to actually celebrate the, the similarities and differences of my mentees because maybe one of my mentees might be just so different. For example, a very different generation, a different country, a different language. So it's just a very important attitude to have. The other metaphor that uh, Lillian uses is as a madrina, a godmother. At least as she says when she's working with Latinos. And that, that's the concept that's used to not mean the parent. I'm, for example, I'm nobody's mother when I'm a mentor. I'm nobody's mother. I don't need to be. You've had a mother, I hope. Um, no, I'm not a sibling, right? But you're a madrina. You're someone who's there to help solve the situation, call on those who may have some resources available for their circumstances. And for me, it is very important because one of these, the critical activities of mentoring is to help the person negotiate the system and to develop functional coping skills, more functional. And she acknowledges, yes, that does sound a lot like therapy, but mentoring, good mentoring, sometimes will have to be like, like therapy. And so for me, in my own personal experience, th those last few words are really critical. Because for the most part, it is important to accept who your mentors are, how they act, how they speak, who they are, how they dress, whatever. But there are going to be times where you need to assist your mentees to think critically about their strategies, about what they're doing and what they're saying. Because sometimes what they're doing is self-destructive, is hurtful to themselves and to others. Very important to have those talks. You're not doing anybody a favor by slapping them on the back saying, good job, when in fact you don't, that's not what you're thinking. You have to have those occasional conversations, and I say occasional, it's not a weekly thing, I hope. But they're really important to have. Two other amazing colleagues who've also been important influences in your mentors as well, because they come regularly to the round table, Dr. Thomas Parham, who you saw here yesterday, and, jo and Dr. Joe White, who's considered the father of African American psychology. Two years ago, we did a, a round table, yes. Two years ago, we did a hoodies up theme in order to honor Trayvon uh, Martin in terms of his life, his wrongful death, and his legacy. And so Thomas and Joe did this amazing session together, and they shared about how the, actually Joe is Thomas's ment uh, uh, Joe's Thomas's mentor. And Joe, like Janet, went to school at the time, no, no students of color, no black students. And it was actually the president of the university who got him into his program. It was that bad. Um, and so he talks about the importance of mentorship and affirmative action in promoting scholarship and as particular people of color. And frankly, when Joe became Dr. White, his good friend Malcolm X said, well, you know, you're still a second class citizen. He used much saltier language, but the impact was there. Right? And Joe looked at him and said, what? And, and then when he, as Dr. White, went to go find a home for himself and his family, he couldn't get one, at least not in the neighborhood he was looking at. Both Thomas and Joe write, psychology did not prepare them for what it means to be a black man in America. And as a mentor, it is important it's a very important role, then, if you think about Thomas and Joe's life and legacy, that mentoring is about sustaining movement in times of adversity and instilling that sense, yes, you can go all the way. Yes, you can go all the way. Both of them had their doctorates before the age of 30. Other important mentors that have helped share, um, shape me as a queer woman uh, Cheria Moraga, Glor Gloria Anzaldúa, Audre Lorde, Dr. Oliva Espin. And I love this quote by uh, Audre Lorde. There are 50 million of them. I have half of them on my wall, but I, I just, uh, anything that comes out of her mouth. Here she says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. 
Mentoring means supporting ourselves and each other through all stages, even though if those perceived in the powerful positions see it and you and mentoring as an act of war. Closer to home, we have folks like Ruth Fassinger and Bev Green, who've done so much to centralize queer voices in psychology, particularly queer voices of color. Some of my peer mentors, uh, Arlene Noriega, Angela Ferguson, and Susan Kashibit uh, West, all of them have played an amazing role. In particular, when I think about queer mentors, and this is what Greg was talking about a little bit earlier, is the importance of acknowledging our intersections. And she, and Chetty Moraga is, is just starkly honest about what it meant for her to come out as a lesbian in her early adult. Because it was only when she did that that she was able to own that she's a feminist woman, that she's a Chicana, that she's a brown-skinned woman. She writes, it wasn't until I acknowledged and confronted my own lesbianism in the flesh that my heart felt identification with and empathy for my own mother's oppression as being poor and educated in a Chicana was realized. My lesbianism is the avenue through which I've learned the most about silence and oppression. She also further realized something even just deeper, that as coming out as a lesbian, as a Chicana lesbian, she realized that her own particular relationship to being a sexual person was a radical stand in direct contradiction to and in violation of the women she was raised to be. So in mentoring relationships, it's critical to acknowledge the ways you are similar and different from others and that the, your difference may be experienced as a violation, even a transgression of others' expectations, including negative attitudes that have been internalized about oneself. Queer mentors have spoken about intersectionalities, and you might have noticed in my, my first slide, I had a, a beautiful quote from trans activist Janet Mock, who so perfectly and succinctly said, for me, personally and politically, there's no separating my womanness, my blackness, my transness from my meanness. Then, of course, there are my peer mentors. These are my colleagues that have served with me uh, as president of the National Latino Psychological Association. This group, and by the way, there are three more uh, presidents in, in line now. They've been my brothers and sisters since we together founded the NLPA in the early 2000s. We actually just wrote a paper about our leadership style as Latinos running a Latino professional organization. And so we were identifying what's, what's important to us, what guides us in, as we figure out how to be Latino psychologists in a professional organization. So we looked at our, our values, personalismo, the madrina, padrino style relationships I, I earlier mentioned, especially with early career professionals and students. And we also very strongly emphasize collective empowerment and giving back to our community. As a matter of fact, we actually developed this organizational chart as we uh, talked through our paper. And as you'll notice, you know, most organizational chart or that pyramid thing, uh, we went circular because we wanted to communicate our own values that it is our Latino communities and NLPA members who are at the heart of everything that we do. It, they guide what we do. Andres Consoli, who was one of our presidents, uh, coined a term introspection. You've heard the term introspection. Introspection refers to that reflexi reflexive examination that takes place between members of a group through their dialogic interchange, and, and it transcends just a singular approach to thinking. It transcends introspection, but they complement each other. That is the way we wrote this paper. And if you've ever written a paper with eight of, of your colleagues, you will realize how important it is to have a collective perspective. And so we've used introspection to guide us as we've developed a number of our policies dealing with immigration, abusive inter interrogation practices, police brutalities, and even professional ethics. 
We actually take this so seriously that when APA comes calling for our endorsement of their presidential candidates, we take it to the membership. We never endorse any candidate that our membership does not. And we've yet to endorse an APA candidate. <laughs> A key approach to our leadership style in the NLPA is something we call, that's called servant leadership, modeled by none other than Martin Luther King and Cesar Chavez. As Greenleaf, who turned that, um, this construct, and I, I know when I first heard the word servant, I had a little like, what? But, but listen a little bit to, to the, the language and think if the word servant gets stuck in your throat, think service. Um, that servant leaders serve the people they lead, emphasizing the best test of such leaders is those who are served, they, the, the people who are served actually grow as persons. They become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servant leaders. I'm sure that's how we're all feeling in the last five weeks. Not quite. So a key outcome of any mentoring relationship that is, is by serving your mentees who then will go on to serve others. That's how you become a societal change agent. So it's time to celebrate our next gen mentors. So these are photos of some super amazing students I've been so blessed to work with and who are now moving on to help others. So let me start with Dr. Greg Payton, who, of course, just in his uh, wonderful servant leadership role as Winter Roundtable, just introduced me. Greg is an openly gay man who married his longtime partner right here in New York City on the first day it was legal to do so. And now they have two beautiful children. This is his, his first. Yay. Dr. Georgia Rudway is an international student, and so she was actually very limited in the kinds of paid opportunities that were available here in the United States. Luckily, the roundtable coordinator was a role she could do, so we actually benefited from Georgia's commitment. Marielle Buque and Natalie Mendez, who along with Dr. Luisa Bonifacio, found that, if you look up there in the hot air balloon, that not only can you save the world, you can actually do it while flying in a hot air balloon. So, and I, I put this picture up there in all seriousness because um, as Liz Geiger said in that film yesterday about the round table, it's draining doing social justice work. It's just draining. Um, and so it is absolutely critical to take those moments to feel the joy and love in your life that provides you the reason for you, the work that you do. You need to feel it. You, can, you know, I, I just think that's really important. And that is something I tell my students. It's important to have personal life as well as professional life. We have Elizabeth Hernandez, who is doing an amazing dissertation on how social justice activism actually enhances the mental health of dreamer students. Naomi Torres Mackey, who is developing an, a truly amazing project on single mothers and their children. Peggy Liu, who's doing community advocacy work. Michael Awad, who's been a, a, a fellow several times, including the very prestigious APA Minority Fellow. And so Michael takes his servant leadership so seriously, but he also knows how to hobnob with just the right people. For example, President Bill Clinton last summer. I've yet to meet a president, and I already have a mentee sort of rubbing elbows, so. Peace on, peace on. Um, Joanna Rooney is exploring gender roles uh, in, uh, for uh, Asian American women, and there's so little written about that. And she and her husband just had their first child, Daisy. Jack Borenstein is studying to be uh, is studying how uh, being both Jewish and Latino determines our gender roles. And uh, this is very important work, especially in light of the Christian-centric work that marks a lot of Latino scholarship. Cassandra Calle, one of my newest students this year, uh, in light of all the potential criminalization of DACA students, is now starting to look at their sense of belongingness. And then I, I also had a whole slew of Oklahoma students who were super wonderful, so I wanted to honor at least one of 
my students, Becca White, who still is working in Oklahoma as a licensed psychologist and fighting for the rights of LGBT people, immigrants, and so on. And then, of course, all the super amazing Winter Roundtable students. I just saw Veronica Johnson, Karima, uh, Jennifer Chang, who's on internship and still volunteering for the, uh, for the roundtable, which uh, just blew me out of the water. Um, you know, just so many, so many students over the years. Um, and it's just been such a moving thing when you're a director. And you know, especially for doc students who have 50 million things to do, that are due, and they're here on their weekend helping us freely and with love. And I hope that's the feeling you get when you're here at the round table, that this is not only a labor of love, it's a community uh, engagement project. And then, of course, so many of my colleagues, um, Lisa Sp I, my, I do want to acknowledge my TC colleagues who have been absolutely outstanding, Daryl Wing Sue, Laura Smith, Riddy Sandil, Melanie Brewster, George Gushu was on the last slide, so many, Liz Fraga, who are here every year. Uh, they bring their students, and, and then beyond, too. Uh, AJ and Nancy Boyd Franklin, Punky Hepner, just so many, Doris Chang, um, and there's just many, many, Helen Neville's here this year. I was so excited to see her. So it's, you know, one of the other things about the round table, it's, it is a place that you learn valuable content, you feel that community, and then you stay in contact with your people, you know, the friends that you've made over the years. And then, of course, the next generation of Latino psychologists. Um, that picture of the blue-robed uh, individuals, that's the first cohort TC ever graduated in the bilingual mental health concentration. It's the only, yes. the only concentration here in the program, uh, here in the state, and um, you know, it's, and this year it's three times the size. We have 17 people. Dr. Lucy Brattini, Dr. Roseanne Ills, so many. And this group over here is um, from Division 17. These are students who came on their own dime for a leadership workshop. And so I can say that I've seen the future of counseling psychology, and it is in incredibly excellent and caring hands. Servant Leader Alls, and just another shout out to these folks here. You've seen them on the TC web. They're doing an incredible job with the New York City project, uh, work establishing men community mental health right here up in, in the upper Manhattan area. And then several amazing early career colleagues. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Kevin Nadal, Hector Adamas, Nayeli chavez Duena. They were here last year when we did social media uh, and, and how it's important to be digitally competent and culturally competent. And so I just, you know, Hector and Nayeli, I can't believe how prescient their, their session was last year. It was about social media, racism and social media. Can we say that we have had more than our learning about how negatively impactful that is? Uh, but just last year, we were right here talking about that. I also want to acknowledge down here this family. Uh, they won a Social Justice Action Award la a couple years ago. This beautiful family transcended the loss of their son to, and brother to cyberbullying by starting the Tyler Clemente Foundation to combat all forms of bullying, starting with K through 12 and moving on from there. So check out their Upstander program. And then finally, these are two students who are in my heart forever, Laura and Brian. Their work is already iconic, and it will continue to be. Both of them are dreamers, former dreamers. They're in PhD programs, full rides, the whole works, in order to do the work that they must. And it is to them, to all dreamers, to all Latino students, to all international students, all transgender and gender diverse students, all Muslim, Middle Eastern, and Jewish students, all lesbian, gay, and bisexual students, all students of the Black Lives Matter movement, all indigenous students, all students of color, all students from single parent families, all students from low income backgrounds, all students who are social justice allies, all students, 
that I dedicate this talk, these words about mentoring, to you. The mentoring article I referred to earlier, I also had a couple of words to say about mentoring, and I'll just repeat them a little bit for you. Mentoring, if it's meant to mobilize, necessarily must focus on, internalize, uh, on oppression and the internalization of that oppression. The coming to believe of all the negative connotation, the lies, the misrepresentations, the sense that something is your fault, some mess is for you to clean up. And yes, of course, it's true, we have to deal with this mess, right? But it is more in changing the system and not bringing that system's impact onto you. The power of you, each of you, mentoring impact is first, distinguishing the, power, the problems where they lie and the tremendous problems in particularly of systems themselves. And in second, in normalizing the reactions that new scholars and practitioners will have in dealing with oppressive systems and assisting them to find their ways to navigate and change those systems. So I began this address by emphasizing that the personal is the political is the professional. These students live this painful fact every single day of their lives. To be honest, like a good madrina, I worry for them. I do. But I also am angry and mobilizing for them. I have hope and I have faith in them. I have hope and faith in their families, their communities, our communities, our abilities and strengths to find movement and momentum in adversity. I will continue to mentor students in any way I can. These students and thousands, even millions like them, is why there can never be rest for the nasty ever. For as long as brilliant, compassionate, kind, competent students such as these are stopped from their learning, criminalized for their very existence, we can never stop the fight. We must always resist. We must always resist. Thank you. So I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Maville will take a few questions while I invite uh, current mentees, anyone who saw themselves up there or wants to be a part of honoring Dr. Maville with the award today, please join us up here on the stage while we take a few questions. Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah. Any questions? It's okay if you don't. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? So as is tradition, uh, we want to present Dr. Maville with these citations. And I'm actually going to ask some of her current uh, mentees to read them, if you wouldn't mind. I have them printed off here, uh, just so that we can hear a little bit of the words of her um, mentees and colleagues who have benefited from her work. So if I could please sure. present that to you. Absolutely.
I'm delighted to learn that Dr. Maville will be honored with the Janet Helms Award this year at the Winter Roundtable. What a fighting tribute. Like Dr. Helms, her dissertation and professional mentor, Dr. Marie Maville has an outstanding record of professional excellence, including teaching, mentoring, and scholarship. Dr. Maville also exemplifies Dr. Helms' legacy, I agree, in her outreach and advocacy with great integrity, compassion, and humility. I am humbled and proud to be among the many who have benefited from her generous mentoring and support and send my sincere congratulations. And so all the voices and all of you here today share in this joy of presenting Dr. Marie Maville with the 27th Annual Janet E. Helms Award for Mentoring and Scholarship. Please join me in a very generous ovation for Dr. Marie Maville. From my mentee, who is now a psychologist practicing in the field, Dr. Maville, shaped my doctoral career in countless ways, taking me under her wing from day one and believing in me every step of the way. She's a compassionate, thoughtful, and generous person who exudes warmth, charm, and grace. Not only here at TC, but I think everywhere we see her is always love for all of us in a way that is unmatchable. She has always placed great importance on honoring the legacy of those who have paved the way for her while quietly toiling in the background and seeking little acknowledgement for, of her efforts. Her commitment to the field of multicultural psychology and education is unwavering and boundless. This along with her contribution to research and scholarship has positively impacted and enriched the professional lives of many as she remains involved in the advancement of those young in the, in the field while blazing the trail for future leaders. Her generosity of spirit in sharing knowledge, wisdom, and intellectual guidance has been deeply valued by colleagues and students alike. The enthusiastic support and genuine caring shown by her in the role of advisor and mentor has also enabled many to accomplish their goals of academic success at the highest level. She is an exemplary. From a colleague, I first met Marie Maville when she was serving as chair of the Council of Counseling Psychology Training Programs, and I was a new board member. My immediate impression of her was that she was politically astute and one of the most diplomatic people I have ever met. The social grace coupled with a keen intellect and comprehensive understanding of the education and training issues of psychology that has made her a natural and effective leader in the psychology training community. I also had the pleasure of working with Marie on two writing projects and felt blessed to have the opportunity to further my conceptualization of two training issues through my discussions with her. Now that I am fortunate enough to call Marie a friend, I greatly appreciate her sense of humor and enjoy the time we spend making each other laugh. I'm so glad that Marie is being honored for her accomplishments in multicultural education and training. She is most deserving of this award. From another mentee, I have had the privilege and honor of knowing Dr. Marie Maville since the commencement of my training as a counseling psychologist. Dr. Maville interviewed me when I was applying for doctoral programs in 2005. During the interview, I was struck by her gracious demeanor and acclaimed scholarship on multicultural psychology. She exuded a kindness and curiosity that allowed us to discuss and exchange thoughts on the intersection of race, sexual orientation, and gender identity in a research capacity, as well as how we each identified with these varying intersections in our own personal lives. I was surprised and humbled with the ease I felt sitting in the room with her, and I knew at that moment that having her mentorship would be critical to my development as a psychologist. I was fortunate to be accepted to the Counseling Psychology Doctoral Program here at TC and entered doctor, into Dr. Mobile's research lab. It was in her lab and under her mentorship that I found a space of mutual respect and regard for personal and professional progression. She exemplified a mastery in research with not just her seminal contribution to the field of multicultural psychology, but with her commitment to advise her students to find their voice and make it heard, whether it be in the classroom, at conferences, or in journal articles. 
And I will just add, I know we have a list of others, but personally, for me, Dr. Mabel, you have meant so incredibly much in my own development. And I know we met when I was interviewing for programs, and you have been there every step of the way. And I have felt so seen and so heard by you, and as someone who has had to live in the shadows for safety reasons, that has meant so incredibly much. And thank you for everything that you continue to do for me and for other students. And I'll continue with some words from your current students. Dr. Meville accepted me as an advisee after my advisor left Teachers College. I was in a vulnerable position and looking for a lot of guidance. She welcomed me to her research team with open arms and supported my academic progress and will be sponsoring my dissertation. She has been an incredible source of support for me as a fellow person of color managing multiple roles. I'm grateful to have her for guidance as a professor and as a mentor. And I echo all those words. This looks like it has your name on it. <laughs> OK. So without further ado, let's present Dr. Marie Elmaville with this incredible honor that is incredibly deserved. Thank you for leaving behind this legacy. You're amazing. You are amazing. Because you all are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's circular. Yeah. Just like the. Uh, <laughs> Columbia, they say compliments come and compliments go. So. Absolutely. See what we see? This is it? <laughs> right in, in vivo. <laughs> <laughs> So the Janet E. Helms Award for Mentoring and Scholarship is presented to you, Dr. Marie Elmaville, here at Teachers College, Columbia University, on February 25, 2017, for, uh, to honor you in exemplifying the role of mentor and the role of scholar. <laughs> 